Um, okay, yeah, so my name is James I'm working with Honland and Bremer and Alex Swarthwick. Uh, and we are looking at uh, how adversely shear currents affect the stability of surface waves. Uh, so before I delve too deeply into my project, I want to tell you quickly about the, uh, the Stemfjord. So the Stemfjord is a medium-sized cement carrier. Uh, it was about 11 meters wide, around 80 meters, around 80 meters long, and had a load of around four kilotons. Uh, so the Stemfjord uh, took a journey through the Pendulum Firth in 2000 and, uh, 2015. Uh, so it left Denmark on the 30th of December, uh, headed into the Pendulum Firth. Uh, it, it entered the Pendulum Firth on the 2nd of January. Um, on the 3rd of January, it stopped. On the, third of Jan on the 2nd of January, later on in the day, it actually stopped transmitting its automatic identification system. Uh, and then a day later, it was, uh, it was found off by that. Uh, so the semi-fuel capsized uh, during its journey through the Pentland Firth. And this was very recent, so this was only 2015. And the uh, Marine Accident Investigation Board concluded their study and said that Seven Fjord sank when it encountered very violent breaking seas. And uh, the MAIB said that these were due to a strong air tidal stream with um, waves going against the uh, tide. So the MAIB said that these conditions were predictable and uh, Seven Fjord shouldn't have gone through the pendant birth anyway. Um, but what exactly makes waves and adverse currents so dangerous? So sailors have always sort of known, and a lot of papers that I've been reading um, tend to quote captains quite a lot because they have a lot of experience and our, our data on the open ocean is, is not, that, um, not that great. Uh, so we've, uh, this is a picture by Turner on the junction of the Thames into the Medway, so where the Thames comes out into the North Sea, uh, we have waves coming from the North Sea heading up the Thames, and they're encountering, encountering this strong adverse current. And what we tend to see, and what has always been sort of um, observed uh, throughout history by mariners, is that we get uh, an increase in amplitude and an increase in frequency as well. So we've got waves heading up against an adverse current. And this produces an increase in the wave steepness. So the wave steepness here is epsilon, and it equals the wave number times the amplitude. Uh, but why is that an issue? So um, here at the top, we've got an equation uh, that says Stokes expansion for the free surface elevation. And we can see we've got, uh, we've got uh, three terms here in epsilon, but actually that would go off. There's actually an infinite number of terms. Um, but when we're looking at waves of low steepness, we tend to ignore the epsilon squared and the higher order terms, and we tend to just keep lowest order terms. Now when epsilon gets quite large, so when, when we've got these adverse currents, uh, we can no longer ignore uh, these higher order terms. And we have to take into account these nonlinear um, non effects. So one of the ways that we can investigate that is by looking at reduced form equations. So the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is a reduced form equation. So someone has taken the governing equations um, for the system uh, and essentially done a lot of clever maths that I don't understand um, and reduced the nonlinear linear Schrodinger equation, which is it. So yeah, so we bring those back in. <laughs> and then we uh, look at that. Nonlinear Schrodinger equation here at the top. <coughs> Um, it's a classical wave equation, so it tells us how a packet changes in space and time. So here, tau is a, um, a time coordinate, and big X is a spatial coordinate. L and M are constants that depend on the frequency and the wave number um, and the steepness of the, um, of the carrier wave. So here, we're trying to solve for A in red. Um, so there are a couple of solutions that are known about. Uh, first one on the left is perhaps the simplest. Um, 
So the, uh, uh, the surface here shows the uh, packet amplitude, so it's, it's a flat plane, it's purely regular, it's the same amplitude wave all over. Look, fairly boring. Um, we then have some more complex ones, so the Ahmadiyya breather, which has these large spikes, and also the Peregrine breather. Um, so if we look at the um, Ahmadiyya breather uh, in space and time, you can see that we've got uh, a number of spikes reoccurring. And this reoccurrence comes from an instability in the fundamental equations. So uh, this instability is called the Benjamin Fear instability, and essentially what it means is that you can start off with a regular wave like the Stokes solution, and you can end up, if you put in a very small amplitude perturbation, so if you start off with a small sort of lump in your regular wave, that lump can grow and reach amplitudes three times larger than the carrier wave, uh, which is what we're seeing here in the Ahmedia breather. And then that um, sort of modulation, so that's what we're going to call it, the, um, uh, as this hump grows three times the carrier amplitude, it then decreases again and grows again and decreases and it will keep recurring. Um, so so we're, we're producing waves that are enormous, followed by very low troughs as well, so um, sort of fairly dangerous, dangerous stuff if you were to encounter it. Um, and then the peregrine breather is essentially the limit when you take the, uh, the period between these recurrences to infinity. So we then have just one, uh, one wave, three times the height of the surrounding waves that occurs in space and time, and then just disappears without a trace. Um, so as I said, the, the two last ones are to do with Benjamin Fear instability. So it's a fundamental instability that occurs in, in, um, in these waves when we have um, uh, certain level of steepness. So which one are we interested in? Well, obviously we're going to start working with the Stokes one because it's the most boring and the most uh, well, the easiest to actually work with. So what happens when we give the Stokes solution a small nudge in the frequency domain? We can see here what we've got is an example of the Benjamin Fear instability happening in a Stokes wave. So this is similar to what we just saw in the Ahmedia breather and Peregrine breather. Um, but we're starting off with a regular wave down at the bottom, so zero meters from the wave maker. Um, and we see uh, this formation of wave pulses as the wave travels down the tank. And actually, if you do linear stability analysis on this, you get an unbounded growth, um, as we see in the... Uh, as you see in the spectrum. So uh, when I'm talking about unbounded growth, what I mean is growth in sidebands. Um, so uh, as we go into the um, Y direction, uh, we're seeing uh, we're moving away from the wave maker. Uh, so we start off with a fairly regular wave with very small sidebands, primarily just the one component, and then those sidebands grow. And in reality, they grow um, at the expense of the carrier wave. But here, in our linear stability analysis, that doesn't actually come out. Uh, so these waves aren't always unstable. They have regions of stability, regions of instability. They tend to be um, most unstable when you have uh, sidebands quite close to the carrier wave. So here we've got carrier wave, two sidebands, fairly close. And we're looking at this red dot on the graph so we can see got a growth rate that will reach a maximum as we move out. So uh, moving our side hands out, we get closer to the maximum, and even further, um, we go over that maximum and get to a, and we will eventually get to a stable regime. So eventually when we get to a broadband enough spectrum, when we bring these side hands out far enough, we'll actually reach a stable regime where we won't see any of this uh, growth that reduces the large waves. Uh, so what we're, what we're interested in is how does a current, and specifically a shear current, affect um, that stability regime. So we've already seen that having an adverse current can increase the steepness, um, and that uh, increases this instability because of these nonlinear effects that I spoke about. Um, when we introduce shear, what we get now is the contour plot on the right is essentially the same graph that we saw on the previous slide. Um, but in an extra dimension, right? So it's just this one on the right, um, 
in an extra dimension known as the contour plot. Uh, so the extra dimension is on the y-axis here. Uh, big omega is the shear rate. So the top half of the graph is what we've got positive shear, which is the top diagram, and the bottom one is bottom half is attributed to the bottom diagram, which is negative shear. Uh, so what we can see and what um, what I'd like you to, to take away is that as we go from zero to positive shear, you can see that some regions which initially were stable, i.e. This, this blue zone where it's zero, um, are now becoming unstable. So we're destabilizing the flow. Or well, we're destabilizing the wave, sorry. Um, and you can also see that areas that were um, or the, the maximum, so where we had a maximum of uh, growth rate here, actually becomes even, more, even less stable and we get much larger growth rates. So we were interested in trying to um, experimentally recreate this, what is essentially a surface, um, and see whether the shear actually has a significant effect. Because what we'd like to know is, does the shape of the current, or does the fact that there's current, which one is dominant? So what we did is we did some experiments down in UCL. Um, they have got the flume down there that does very stable, linearly sheared current, um, which is what we were interested in. It's very difficult to actually produce a linearly sheared current experimentally. Uh, so not only did we want to compare the cases where we have shear and where we don't have shear, we also wanted to um, compare our results with some uh, numerical results. But I'll first run you through some results that we've got. So these are fairly, oh sorry actually, I'll first just define how we, I'll first say how we define growth rate. Um, so on the x-axis we've got distance from the wave maker, and on the y-axis we've got a normalized amplitude. So this is normalized for the carrier wave, so we're only interested in how the sidebands behave. Um, so what we can see here is um, an almost exponential growth to begin with, and then followed by a drop-off. So we are really interested in the exponential growth that begins with. So the equation up here, the y equals beta e to the upper x, we're interested in the alpha. That's our growth rate. And this drop off here is something called the Fermi Pasta Hulam recurrence. So um, we get modulation, we get demodulation, and that will continue. Um, sort of, uh, you get wave pulses that become regular waves, and then regular waves that become wave pulses, and so on and so forth. Um, and one of the things that we'll be looking at in the future is how do we actually define where this bit begins? Because at the minute, I'm sort of doing it by eye, saying, okay, that point is not quite right, and that's just open to so much bias, it's unbelievable. So, um, so these are very preliminary results. Um, but what do we actually see? So this is um, an, uh, a zero shear case. So we've got around 1.5 hertz frequency regular wave with small amplitude perturbations, uh, small sideband perturbations, sorry. Um, we're traveling down the tank as we go up. And you can see there's not too much going on. You can see it's more about modulation to begin with because we seeded the signal and it sort of gets a bit worse. It's uh, easier to see in the frequency domain. <coughs> um, here, so we can see we've got sidebands, very small, I think they're around well, I can't remember, a fifteenth or something of the amplitude. Uh, the carrier wave, um, but they, they grow to about twice the height, so it would be about twice the amplitude. Um, so not an enormous amount um, of growth. But then what happens when we have adverse shear? So this is if we have exactly the same condition, so we're telling our wave makers to do exactly the same thing, and we're just adding an adverse current. What we see is... Um, much larger amount of modulation. So here we've got our regular wave which kind of looks very similar to before, should. Um, but now we're getting these um, wave pulses being formed and very large waves occurring. Um, and actually when you observe this in, this in the tank, you tend to see wave breaking. Um, so we're getting towards the limit of steepness. Um, and again, you can see it very clearly in the, in the spectrum. So we've got two clear sidebands. We gave, we gave the signal these sidebands and then they grew. And you also get these uh, higher components here, um, which uh, also account for some of the amplitude. 
So, at the, so that's what, what we've done. We've, uh, we've, we've looked at the zero shear case and the shear case. Uh, what we'd like to do next is really try and separate out the effects, so separate out the shear and the adverse current, because we know they, they both affect the stability of the waves, and we'd like to know exactly how much each of them does that. Um, we're also looking to compare the results in a, with the uh, results from a fully numerical flu, uh, which some of our collaborators in UCL have built. Um, and we'd like to do a nonlinear stability analysis to look at the Sterling Pass at Ulam Recurrence. And then uh, later on in the project, we're going to be going into flow wave and looking at horizontally sheared current. Um, so this is all vertically sheared current, and we'd also, which um, uh, we'd also like to look at horizontally sheared current. So currents that you might find around the uh, Agulis current in South, in South Africa, um, where it's well known that these uh, brain like waves occur. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.